Welcome, bent riders around the world. My name is Gary Solomon, and you're watching the Laid Back Bike Report. So glad to have you guys all with us uh, today. We have a really interesting show for you with a couple of uh, guests that I think will have a lot to say about uh, recumbent riding and recumbent bikes, uh, something that you're going to be interested in seeing. So let's, uh, let's move along with uh, what it is you're going to actually see today. I'm going to tell you about today's uh, show. First, we have with us uh, Randy Ridings. Uh, Randy uh, has created an amphibious bent project, uh, a little uh, four-wheeled uh, kayak water and road riding quad yak, as he calls it. And uh, we're going to talk to Randy all about that project and uh, show you a bunch of pictures. So I think you'll enjoy that. We have an old friend uh, with us uh, back this time. It's Peter Stahl, the bicycle man been on the show a few times, and uh, he's going to start a series uh, with us on the show uh, about uh, recumbent history based on the, the amazing uh, recumbent museum pieces that he has actually hanging from his shop uh, in upstate New York. So we're glad to have Peter with us. Uh, we have uh, Brian Ball, of course, with us uh, with the news. He's going to talk a little bit about the uh, Bent Rider Awards uh, that just uh, came out at the end of the year that uh, you guys all voted on. Uh, we're going to have uh, Denny uh, Voorhees with uh, the sports. He's going to talk uh, a little bit about the final race of last year and uh, what's coming up in ultra racing in, recumbent, in the recumbent world uh, this year. So we're glad to have Denny as well. And then uh, something we've done the last couple of months that seems to be pretty popular, we're going to continue with the Layback Bike Report contest where if you watch the show live and you pay attention, uh, you have a chance to win a couple of amazing prizes. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna give you uh, the questions that you'll uh, have to answer a little bit later on the show, but here's the rules. Um, if you are the first viewer to best answer the questions that I ask, uh, you will win. Uh, I want you to email the answers uh, to the questions to report at gmail.com, laidbackbikereport at gmail.com. And I'll have a look at those during Denny's uh, sports report and see if we can't find ourselves a winner. This is for live viewers only. So you guys that are watching right now, this is for you. Uh, and if you happen to have won in the last couple, three months, uh, sit on your hands if you would, and uh, let's give some other people a chance. We'll rotate this uh, prize through. Um, so, and the prize, uh, the prizes again this, this month will be a choice of a laid back bike report hat, like you see uh, Fred wearing right back here, and a couple of our panelists you'll see in a minute uh, are also wearing those. And, uh, and Fat Chick Gone AWOL, our uh, Anna Mitchell book, uh, is also available as a choice for a prize. So, uh, I hope you'll take advantage of that, and uh, we'll play the game a little bit later on. Now, I hope you won't forget to subscribe to uh, our YouTube channel. If you look down in the lower right-hand corner, you'll see little red subscribe button. It really helps us out. If you click on that and subscribe and maybe click the notification bell there, you'll get a notification whenever we go live or uh, post a new video. And if you're looking for new, uh, more information, uh, past shows, uh, extra uh, media, all kinds of stuff about the Laidback Bike Report, in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see a little uh, eye pop up. And that will take you directly to our website, uh, laidbackbikereport.com, where you can find lots more information. So one of the important aspects of our show is the live chat. And YouTube provides this for us. And we really enjoy seeing everybody uh, pop on the chat. It's a little uh, recumbent community that we have going, a live community that uh, that interacts with the show. And uh, so please uh, take advantage of that. You can, uh, if you're on the actual YouTube webpage, you'll see it probably a little bit to, to your right, uh, just depending on the size of your screen, maybe a little bit below. Mobile, uh, if you're on the mobile uh, YouTube, you'll see it below as well. If you're on Bent Rider or Twitter or Facebook, uh, you might want to click through to the little um, YouTube icon you see below. So you go to the actual YouTube page, and then you'll be able to take part in our live chat. All right, folks, I want to be able to, uh, at this time, uh, take a minute to tell you about our sponsors. We have, first of all, TerraCycle, makers of exquisite recumbent parts and accessories for your bent. And... Trailside.bike, 
those uh, fine recumbent uh, bikes that you'll find in Andrew's shop there on the Withlacoochee Trail in Florida. Please, if you're down there, stop in and say hi to Andrew. And Velocity, builders of performance wheels and rims, handmade in the USA. All right, folks, let's, tell, let's talk for a minute about who is with us today. I have a group of fine panelists who have become indispensable to me. These guys either uh, are doing reports or doing the directing or the slideshows, uh, do a wonderful job and make this show what it is. So let me introduce uh, our, our panelists today. First, uh, from Raymond, uh, Mississippi. He's uh, doing our directing today, our pal Trey Burgoyne. Hi, Trey. And uh, Trey is muted, but he said hi. Um, hi. Yeah, that's, I thought that's what you had said. And then also uh, moving along to Rochester, New York, the founder and editor of Bent Rider and the anchor of the laid back news desk, Brian Ball. Hey, Brian. Hello, how's it going? It's good to see Hope you Hope you're here. warmer than we are. Right, not many of us are too warm right now, but I guess where we're going, uh, it's, it's plenty warm. Uh, well, we'll talk about that later on. And from Sarah, Pennsylvania. And I know where I'm going, it's plenty warm. Desk. You know where he's going. It's going to be warm. It's Denny <laughs> Voorhees. <laughs> How you doing, guys? Good to be back. It's good to see you, Den. Uh, and uh, here's a warmer spot, Dallas, Texas. It's Mr. Wizard, Doug Davis. Hey, Doug. Hey, Gary. Good to see you again. It's great to have you on. And here's a guy taking on a big challenge today, Larry Seidman, doing our slideshow duty. Uh, it's, it's great to have you, and thanks for helping out today on the slideshow, Larry. Hi, uh, it's above freezing here. <laughs> which is good at altitude, huh? And uh, here's a guy who just sent his Santa suit to the cleaners, finally back with us. It's Larry Varney from Cold Spring, Kentucky. Hey, Larry. I am Gary and everybody else. And I just noticed my outside temperature, 34.3 degrees. So, you know, spring's really, on the way. Just a couple of degrees uh, short of what his body temperature is right now, folks. So it's really good to have you with us, Larry. Thank you. All right, folks, let's uh, let's move on to our interview. Uh, if you want to come on back, here we go. Uh, first of all, today, I want to introduce to you a gentleman from Carthage, Missouri. His name is Randy Ridings, and he's a retired Army communications officer whose motto I found out uh, that I guess he developed while he was in the service says, if it's stupid, but it works, <laughs> it's not stupid. Bingo. Hey, how you doing, Randy? Good to be on the show, Gary. <laughs> it's it's great to have you on. Is that right? Was that the right motto? That is that yeah, that's a kind of a, a joke between my daughter and I now a lot is is that exact saying. And and yes, people in the military actually use that. It's it's that's a great one. I like it. All right. If you can, Randy, uh, before we get to your presentation about the uh, quad yak and such, can you tell us a little bit about your biking history, more specifically your your bent biking history? How did you get into all this? Well, actually, the quad yak is my first recumbent. The first recumbent I ever rode was one I built. Um, I, I rode biked and mountain biked for years. Uh, one of the things that came about in the military was uh, some C7 vertebrae arthritis. So I, after you know, not being able to bike for a while because I can't really do handlebars, regular handlebar placement anymore, uh, I always wanted a recumbent and then I always wanted an amphibious vehicle. So I ended up combining the two and I built this thing and it's the first recumbent I ever built. Uh, I've had it now. Uh, this is It's about five years old now. Um, and in the meanwhile, I have got a regular two-wheel recumbent, and there's a picture of that in there. But I don't ride it as much as I ride this thing. Okay. So, and, and I know you uh, you have some ideas about future recumbent projects and stuff. Maybe we'll touch on those a little bit later as well. But at this point, I think maybe let's go ahead and go to your slides, and let's talk about this amazing uh, amphibious recumbent that you built. Let's, let's start there. Yeah, like I said... Uh, I mean, the earliest sketches I've found of this thing were back from about 2008, but I got serious about it in 2013. Uh, and when I was, uh, when I stripped everything out of this boat to do some work on it, I decided I would try to do a full scale model, which you see here, to see if I could actually sit in it and fit in it and, and pedal it and if everything would fit together. And when it all looked like it would mesh, uh, next slide. 
Then I uh, enlisted the help of my retired engineer father, who you see here cutting up a donor bike. Um, he looked at it and, you know, as, 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 as a good father will do, decided he would uh, entertain my craziness and help me out. Um, so we started working on it in his shop because I don't really have a shop this, <laughs> this good. Uh, good. Next picture. And uh, we, th this is what having an engineer for a father gets for you. And I'll get more into this design later, but all the mechanism, essentially a transmission, a differential and two disc brakes fit in a space smaller than a soccer ball inside the boat. So they stay nice and dry uh, and, and, and aren't exposed to the elements. Okay, next slide. So we started uh, cutting stuff up, and when we when we first started, like I said, we used just uh, garage sale donor bikes. Uh, we used steel frame, so it was pretty heavy. We were just trying to see if this would work at all. But you see here uh, the bearing plates that will eventually hold the front axle and that whole mechanism um, welded to an upside down bike frame, welded to a steel frame. All right, next slide. And here is that mechanism in there. So uh, the, the axle is actually split to give me a dual wheel drive up front. So both front wheels turn and yet you have, it's not a true differential, we call it a, a faux differential. That's where those shoulder bolts are. That's where the split in the axle is. You see where the disc brakes are. So your chain ring, and actually I'm looking at this from straight down from above uh looking at it from at it from from behind it would actually the chain ring would be on the right hand side so it's kind of flipped over in a way but you drive the chain ring it drives the shoulder bolts which drive a freewheel on the other side and so each wheel can freewheel independently of each other okay next slide and before we get to the next slide, Randy, I just want to remind folks uh, one more time, if you're on the live chat and you're watching this presentation and you have a question for Randy, go ahead and pop it on the live chat and we'll make sure to uh, get the question to him so he can answer that. So, sorry, go ahead, Randy. Yes, and we might as well point out, I, we'll be, you're going to be putting my YouTube uh, information uh, in, the, in the comments. And I mean, I do like an hour, you know, long four or 15 minute videos just on this build. So if you want a lot more detail, go watch the YouTube video. Yeah, we'll have it all in the, in the <laughs> description of, of this video, all the links there. Absolutely. Okay. So, so here you see the frame coming together. There's my seat and the, and the, the steel frame uh, coming back to this single uh, head tube in the rear. All right, next slide. And there it is with, the forks and you see instead of a handlebar I just have a short bar that gets pulled with some cables that are then just regular sheets cables that then go under the seat to a crossbar and I have under seat steering and you'll see that here in a minute and you can also see we've started putting the the uh, cranks and the sprockets and everything up, up front in the boat uh, all right next slide and there's my my paddle building station I used a uh, coroplast, which is a corrugated plastic material, and it has a grain because it's corrugated. So what these paddles are is two thicknesses of that turned 90 degrees to, to uh, cross grain the two pieces, which makes them considerably stronger. And then just glued together with some heavy duty spray epoxy. Okay, next slide. And there you see the wheels with the paddles and the rear wheel with a coroplast disc affixed to it to act as a rudder when it's in the water. Okay, next slide. And there it is assembled. And now you can see the handlebars, uh, you know, brake handles. The shifter on this one was down between my knees. We've changed that on the on the rebuild. We'll get to the rebuild here in a little bit, but you gotta see where everything goes together now. Uh, that the axle, like I said, all three wheels inside the boat. So the the Tires on the outside are are just pinned directly to that axle, so they can then get rusty and wet, and it doesn't really matter that much. Okay, next slide. All right, this was the first time this actually went in the water, and it, it was not to test um, 
whether it worked, but it, rather it was to test to see whether it was still positively, <coughs> positively buoyant. Uh, I had added some foam plugs front and back to compensate for about the 100 extra pounds of, of gear that we put in this thing. And I took it out in a little backwater I have and tipped it up and filled it full of water and stood inside it until the bubbles quit coming up and then let it go and watch it bob to the surface. Because you really want to find this out in four feet of water, not 40 feet of water when you're crossing some lake. So <laughs> um, that was the very first test I did was to see if this thing still floated, and it did. All right, next slide. Oh, and here's the movie. Let me set this up real quick. So when we play this movie, what you're going to see that at the very beginning um, is it going in the water as a three-wheeler. And you will notice why we change it to a four-wheeler. So you can see what the problem is uh, when you transition from land to water, you get a little bit of lean to it. So we really quickly uh, cut the rear end off and made this into a four-wheeler. There's a couple launches, both going in, coming out. And then this last one is a launch with about 50 to 60 pounds of camping gear and food and everything completely loaded because I wanted to know whether or not it would uh, still float if I had it all loaded. With and you can see a little here. better on this uh, this time around. Yeah. Thanks go. for running that again, Larry. Um, by the way, Randy, I've, you might you might get to this here a little bit later anyways, but I've got a question uh, from uh, London, England. It's our pal John Williams who wants to know what sort of cruising speed do you get when you're on water? Uh, cruising speed in water, uh, about two and a half miles an hour, but I'm hoping that improves. I've, we've made some changes in a rebuild, and, I've, and I'll get to that later, and I'll tell you why I think I'm going to be going a lot faster now. Okay. Right now, uh, and I've, I've hit like three miles an hour, but usually about two, two and a half uh, flat water. Of course, a lot of times I'm going down a, a stream and add that, that uh, water speed to my speed, and I've gone down rivers at 10 miles an hour before. Down like the Missouri River, but that's adding, you know, the seven and a half miles an hour that the river was going. And on land, let's uh, go ahead and throw this out out as well as I would flat flat pavement, no wind. I can cruise about twelve miles an hour usually. Okay, that's pretty common. Okay. Um, so the other thing, real quick, and this is part of that video, but this is just a still from it. Uh, I want to point out one of the design, can you know, one of the design. Uh, considerations for this was that it's front wheel drive and besides shortening the drive train and all those kind of things it also makes it where you can climb a ramp because if you're rear wheel drive and you hit that ramp you don't you don't have any traction to get up get up a boat ramp so I can come out of the water at a run and climb it where otherwise you'd have to get out of the boat and haul it up the ramp okay next slide Here's a, a shot going down the river, and, and this is, you know, pictures like this told me that I needed to redesign some things. I actually, I already kind of knew there was a problem. Um, you can see how much I'm splashing on the sides, and that's because my paddles hit the water in this configuration at about 70 degrees. They should hit the water at about 33, according to this 90-year-old paddle boat captain in St. Louis that I called to find out about paddle wheel boats. Um, he said 33 degrees was optimum, and I measured mine at about 70. So in the redesign, we fixed that. But one of the reasons I don't go very fast is I'm wasting about two thirds of my stroke. I'm pushing a lot of water down at the beginning, and I'm lifting a lot of water up at the end, and I'm really only getting good stroke at the bottom of the stroke. And you'd see that in one configuration, I had the the those black paddles pulled way back to the sprocket, which gave me a good angle. But the closer back to the axle they get, the less force you have on. What you really want is paddles way out at the, at the edge of the rim and at a 33 degree angle. And we've done something to fix that later. But here's just a good shot of me going down, a, going down some water here. Okay, next slide. And there's an early road shot. I actually probably have some slides you know, in the wrong order. But there's where I live in Carthage, Missouri. That's our courthouse. Uh, and that's the first time. That's the first time it was on the road. Uh, so I went ahead and shot, put that in there. Okay. And the other thing I'd like to point out is you might see that it keeps 
changing configurations. This is an early shop, but I add pontoons and I add wheel wells and you'll see other pontoons and you'll see the wheel wells change and the paddle designs change. And I, I, I'm continuously tweaking this thing, trying to, trying to maximize it. Um, and I've, you know, it, it, I, I'll put something on and if it doesn't seem to improve anything, then, then either I'll go back to a different design or I'll keep working on it. Randy, if I could yeah, stop you sure. for a second here, we got a, a couple of questions. I think there's probably plenty of places we could uh, jump in and answer <laughs> these. But um, first one from uh, Ran Chen. Uh, hello, Ran. Uh, he said, won't the pedals add air resistance when driven on land at high speed? I think he means paddles. paddles. Yeah, uh, they, and they, can you address they, that? They really don't seem to. Um, you know, they're, they're adding resistance one way but they should be adding force the other way. Uh, I, I could not ever discern a real difference in road speed using those things. It just does, I don't think I'm going fast enough to, to really matter. And my wheel wells are shielding that a little bit as well. I mean, that, that wind resistance is the least of my worries. The, the, the biggest problem is this thing weighs 145 pounds uh, before I pack it for camping and 200 pounds once I'm packed. So that's, <laughs> that's where the real, uh, resistance comes from is just, yeah. all, so when just you're traveling, way. when you're yeah. traveling just a few miles an hour, the air resistance is really not a huge yeah, deal, not, it, no right. matter what. The yeah. other question that I see here, um, and I, I think you sort of addressed this a little bit before, maybe you can elaborate a little bit is about the axles. Uh, are the axles sealed coming into the boat? They're yes, somewhat, but the but the axles sit about four or five inches above the water line. That's why it, you know we use the biggest tires. I'm use, I'm running twenty nines on the front, and that raises that axle up high enough where it is above the water line by about four inches. So I do seal them, and I have the wheel wells to keep because paddle wheels splash a lot to to keep water from coming into the boat from the paddles and all that splashing around but it's not the the, the axles aren't below the water line so it doesn't that's not an issue okay all right let's go ahead where are we at next okay so there's so here's a uh pretty much what i had settled on my wheel wells my paddles you see the paddles now are pulled back towards the axle which help like i said helps the angle but it but it cuts the force you get on it because the farther out, then the leverage you get would be more. And you can see, you know, my, my wheel wells, uh, my, the, the discs on the rear wheels that act as a rudder in the water and all that kind of stuff. Okay. All right. So let's go to, so now that it's built and I know that it works, uh, I decided to do a test. So I did a 11 day trip in Missouri. Um, I started up in Clinton, Missouri. I started on roads and I went through the Ozark Mountains and it got over 100 degrees on the day that's photographed here and it's packed with all my gear. So right there sitting there, it weighs about 200. I weigh about 200. So I'm pushing 400 uh, pounds down the road. There's videos on the YouTube video about this whole trip if you want to learn more about this. Uh, so I did, I did, I started with roads and then next slide. I went into the Osage River uh, for a couple of days, about four days, and then I went down to the Missouri River. Next slide. Oh nope, it's still Osage. So I camped every night. This was this was a, a totally unsupported trip. Although I stopped at you know if I was near a store, I'd buy Gatorade and water and those kind of things. But I didn't have a chase vehicle. I didn't have anybody with me. I did this whole whole thing as one continuous loop. Uh, this is, you know, so I camped out on, on sandbars most nights. I spent a couple nights in hotels when I had them. Um, and you can see my paddle there. If I need to make sharp turns, like to get to a sandbar, I sometimes have to get the paddle out to, uh, to do regular kayak paddling for maneuverability. Okay. Next slide. And this is on the Missouri river. This is a sandbar I stopped at and that there you can see a good view of the of the newer pontoons that I added to that. And I'll even show you another configuration later. Most of the time they just sat on that PVC frame that held my wheel wells and they just sat beside me. The reason I have pontoons 
is when we when we built this, we backed my weight up a few inches and we lifted it a few inches, and then my legs are continuously up on the pedals where normally in kayaking they would be down in the boat. So I've lifted my center of gravity considerably. So it made the boat a little bit uh, a little bit tippy and the rear end was dragging a little bit. It was a little low. So we put some pontoons back in the back uh, to add some stabilization and add some lift. And that actually worked extremely well, even though small pontoons right there did a world of good for supporting this thing. So I only did about 10 miles on the Missouri River. I had made this trip where I could change the, uh, the distance of it by going farther down the Missouri River and farther back up the Katy Trail. Uh, but that shows just, I was kind of running out of time. The Osage River was considerably slower than I was hoping for because they weren't releasing water from the dam that's upriver. And so what I was hoping, about a two and a half day uh, trip down that river ended up being a four day trip. So out of the 11. Okay, good. Next slide. Here, so now I've moved over to the Katy Trail. Uh, came off the Missouri River and got on the Katy Trail. This is a one day that was rainy that I took my rain fly from my tent and built myself a little uh, cupola there, a little, uh, little covering to keep myself a little drier. Um, and if, nobody, if you guys don't know about the Katy Trail, it's this great rail trail in Missouri. It's the longest single rail line rail trail in America still. Um, and I did, uh, well, at the end, I'll show the mileage for this trip. Okay, next slide. So here's a little banner that I made uh, for that trip. So I call this the shakedown cruise. That's a military term. When you take a new piece of gear out and test it, you, uh, and what I was trying to do was test this in its, in every possible uh, thing that it could run into. So paved roads, dirt roads, gravel trails, uh, water, you know, large rivers, small rivers. So I ended up doing about 131 road miles, 77 river miles, and 142 on the Katy Trail for a total of 350 miles in 11 days. And I started and ended in Clinton, Missouri. Just did a big loop uh, for that. Okay. Now, uh, the, a year later, I did another trip with this where I took it up to Washington, Idaho, and Montana. And I was hoping to do a straight through trip, but that didn't really work out because that was the summer that Washington kind of caught on fire. They started closing trails on me. So I ended up having to jump around uh, from state to state. But this trail that I'm on right now, uh, in this picture is the John Wayne Iron Horse Trail. And I did about 150 miles on it up into the mountains. Beautiful, beautiful trail. Uh, but it was extremely slow because it was kind of loose gravel and a one and a half percent grade going up for like 82 miles straight. So I was down, I was making about 20 miles a day uh, on that trail. It was, it was pretty ridiculous. Uh, it was fun. It was beautiful. Go, go ahead and go to the next slide. So this is the kind of views you get on that. I mean, it's gorgeous, but it was just kind of ridiculously slow because of the uh, because of the, the the grade and the and the loose gravel. Next slide. And there's another shot of the same location, just showing the boat. Again, loaded uh, about about 200 pounds with all my gear in it. All right. Next slide. Then I jumped over to Idaho, and this is on a paved trail called the Trail of the Coeur d'Alene. And this is a favorite. This is probably my favorite place I've ever ridden. I like this trail so much. I I did it both directions. Uh, it's 74 miles long, and it is very flat, paved, almost no road crossings. Runs beside some really beautiful little finger lakes. So I ended up doing about 150 miles uh, on pavement here. And I haven't posted videos for this trip yet. I'm kind of working on them. That should be very soon. Those will be going on YouTube and Patreon. Uh, I'll be I'll be getting these videos on. All right, next slide. And then I got, I jumped over to uh, Montana, uh, right around, just outside of Helena, Montana, and got in the headwaters of the Missouri River. And that's what you're seeing here. And sometimes when I'm on the water, I go ahead and put that uh, cover up. You can see my tent poles going up uh, to just keep 
from getting sunburned, you know, too badly. Uh, this is my view, and you, you guys can kind of see I have rear view mirrors posted, and I must have been doing some work on it because I've really got a lot of grease on my <laughs> on my wind my windscreen there. Okay, next slide. And this is why I built this thing, so I could get to places like this that most people just don't ever get to. So this is on the Missouri River. Uh, I just camped on the on the side of the river most nights, or every night that I came down the river. Uh, this is between Helena and Great Falls. That's the, the part I did. That's, a, I think, about 100, 125 miles, something like that. Did you I, run into a lot of people along the way here on this trip? Well, the funny thing is, when I, when I first started up near Helena, I got to this you know, fishing boat ramp. There was all these cars. There was people. There were people uh, getting rafts out and canoes and kayaks. And I'm like, great, I'm going to have company. And I get in the water with all these people and kind of hung out with them for about two hours. They all get to this other boat ramp. All of them left. And the next four days, I pretty much had the river to myself. <laughs> I, I saw like two other fishing boats in, in four days. And at that campsite that I was just at, I climbed up the bluff. And there was a little parking area where a couple of RVs had pulled in and were camping. And I joined their, their campfire for a while and hung out with them and then went back to my own site. Randy, while I have you here, before we get back to that, um, I've got a couple questions here again. Okay. Um, so besides the trails, obviously you've, you've ridden on the, I think you have a couple more pictures of you riding on the roads as well. And, uh, you know, we've done quite a few shows uh, about Velomobiles and uh, some specifically uh, about police stops with Velomobiles. So Dam Runner won. Uh, says, I once had the police stop me in my Velomobile because they received a call of a person riding a kayak up the street. <laughs> I am so impressed to actually see a kayak running up the street. Nice yep. build, he says. So that's uh, more of a comment than a question, but I thought that was that was kind of cool. Um, uh, Denny wants to know what the width of this uh of, of this vehicle is? I have a 32 inch wheelbase uh, width, but then once I throw some of those uh, pontoons and other things and the paddles on it, it's really closer to 40. So I really like four foot shoulders and I get into that on, on uh, some of my videos talking about, you know, when I was riding the, the my shakedown cruise, I, I checked ahead of time that I had four foot shoulders through the Missouri Department of Transportation, but what they didn't say is they cut the one foot rubble strips out of my four feet, leaving me about 36 inches wide with a 32 inch wheelbase. And for about 20 miles, I just sat there and threaded a needle. And it was, I, I couldn't ever get up to speed because uh, one of the other issues of this is the rear wheel drive. And so you get, it can be a little squirrely if you hit bumps that rear end wants to jump around. And especially if you hit something like, like uh, rumble strips, it will actually just pull you that way into traffic. Uh, pretty violently. <laughs> yeah, I would say. Okay, let's move along here. Okay. Yeah. Next slide. So here's one of my campsites uh, along the Missouri River. Uh, I got I got chastised by the beavers who live near this area. They were swimming around, slapping their tail in the water when I was here. Um, and you can see, uh, the, uh, at this stage, I've got I've got like double the number of paddles on the wheels. I'm not even sure. I was just kind of goofing around with stuff, testing uh, what was working. And I have the pontoon still in the frame. And I think the next picture shows it slightly different. Yeah. So uh, here's another uh, campsite of mine on the Missouri River. And now I've taken the pontoons off the the frame. And I've taken the rear wheels off and I put the pontoons over the forks. And that actually moves the pontoons even farther back, which helps lift that rear end up. But it also cuts all the drag from those, those wheels and those forks in the water. So this does, this is one of the things that definitely sped me up some. And if I'm gonna stay in the water for a couple of days and just camp on sandbars, then I reconfigure it like this uh, to to make it a little bit faster and even more stable. It actually improves the stability of the boat quite a bit. And I'll, I'll also note that I'm one of the only people that has to carry a life jacket and a helmet with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of safety equipment, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. Okay, next. 
Oh, all right. So now we're off of that trip, and I just wanted to to bring this up real quick. Just a couple of the other fun rides I've got to do. I was invited down to Crowder College, which is pretty well known for their solar program. And you can actually see my my rig in the back with my daughter napping in it, I think, while we got ready. These guys were doing a solar vehicle race. All these are solar vehicles. Some are solar slash human power as well. Um, and I couldn't line up with them because they're, that's a, their club actually does a race every year and they, you know, there's awards and all that kind of stuff. So I had to wait till they got started, but they invited me down to come. Once I got started, I went out and rode with them for the rest of the day. And I just thought that was kind of fun. Next slide. And I'm sorry. There's no chance that first generation CRX in the background is yours. Is it? Uh, none of those are mine. No. Okay. All right. Sorry. Uh, no, no. I'm a, I'm a Brian's CRX. Kind of nerd, for the Hondas, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, then in, a, in a 2016, the quad deck was in a fire. I actually had it over at my dad's shop, uh, working on some stuff and the frame was in a shop and his shop burned down. So it, luckily the boat was outside, but you know, of course he had to, you know, do insurance and rebuild the shop and all that kind of stuff. And so I was without this for about a year and a half. Uh, dad had, you know, his own projects to work on, obviously, once he get his shop rebuilt. Uh, but we, but in the meanwhile, next slide, I went out and bought that. And that's a, an older Vision, got it used, got a good deal on that. And But I wanted to keep the same muscle groups in shape. So that's the only, like, real recumbent I've ever owned right there, like, commercial one. Um, and this was a, a shot that was taken for a local bike club. But I did. I, go ahead, Gary. Randy, I was just going to ask, do you find yourself when you're riding on your vision looking for puddles to ride through? Uh, <laughs> no, on that thing, I would avoid them because there's, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, that was a real learning curve. You know, my, my rig was a three-wheeler or a four-wheeler, and so I, I did not have to learn recumbent balance until I got that thing. And or then, starting or stopping in the whole right. business, right? So, yep. Yeah. I, I so much prefer coasting to a stop on four wheels than I do on two wheels. That's for <laughs> darn sure. So I kind of couldn't wait to, to build my rig back up. But I did ride this for about a year and uh, put 1,000 miles on it or so. And had a good time with it. And there's also – it's nice that I had this because I, I did some – like heart rate and energy expenditure tests and video that that's one of the YouTube videos I have is comparing this to, to the quad yak on the same course over the same, uh, same distance to kind of show the difference in, you know, pushing a regular recumbent around and pushing the quad yak around what that does to, you know, your energy expenditure. So there's, that's one of the videos that I've got, uh, on, on the YouTube channel as well. All right, next slide. The other thing I started doing was sourcing parts. Uh, and you can actually see my one of my wheels there. I, I also redesigned my wheels with solid plastic discs, and those are foam-filled uh, five five-spoke uh, plastic mag wheels, and they're completely foam-filled now. So if I drop my rear wheels in the water, they actually float now. And then the the one of the biggest differences between this uh, build the rebuild and the, and the old build was a, we went to aluminum this time instead of the original steel. Uh, and this time, because we knew the thing worked, I went out and sourced almost all brand new parts. The first time we just, we've been cutting up, you know, garage sale bikes and donor bikes. And, you know, uh, this time I, I put more money into it. I, I was always humming the, uh, six million dollar man theme you know we we can rebuild it better stronger faster and lighter <laughs> all right next slide so one day when dad was ready we uh i took the boat back over and you you can see a little bit of my rack there we talked about this before when i travel i put the quad deck on top of that car on a homemade rack that i made out of stop sign posts which make great wheel channels because they're just just right for right you know for uh for taking uh, 10 speed bikes up them uh, but i don't have a picture of that to show you guys unfortunately I'll, I'll... all right next slide 
So there you see some of the rebuild. Uh, you can see on the right-hand side, kind of the old rear frame and its forks, and then the new uh, aluminum you see laying around there. That's that uh, 8020 industrial extruded aluminum bar. And it's very strong and it's very light. All right, next slide. Um, and so we got an aluminum bike frame. You see that on the left. There's the burnt up old one on the right. And so I had to, you know, find all aluminum parts to put on this thing. Next slide. We had to build some things. There's, uh, we decided because we were coming off some steel, or I mean, some square aluminum bar, we went ahead and just built our own square aluminum head tubes for the two rear forks. Next slide. And there you see them there cut down. We, they, we made them shorter in that first picture. So there's the rear crossbar now and the head tubes. And you see that big plate that sits on top of the boat. There's a, there's a bar that comes up under the, the, or through the middle of the boat from underneath and transfers that weight down to the frame. Because you got to think, sometimes you have wheels holding up all that weight and the boat, and then you transition to the boat holding up all that weight. And so you have to be able to make that transition without without torquing things or bending things or breaking things. Okay, next slide. There's dad welding the uh, plates that go on the inside. Those kind of hold the weight of the frame up inside the boat. Next slide. And there's that upright bar and that frame that dad was just welding. That bar goes up to the rear crossbar for the rear wheels. All right, next slide. In the front, because we had cut out a lot of the plastic of the boat, we were really worried about if I ever hit something or hit the water fast, uh, that the nose might bend up in the boat. So we cut these two aluminum posts that go inside the boat and the in uh, up up inside the edges, and that actually holds the whole front mechanism and it supports the front of the boat so it doesn't ever fold up. Okay, next slide. All right, so there, you saw the steel version as earlier. Now here's the aluminum version of all the bearing plates and the uh, front, kind of the whole front axle mechanism or what accepts the axle mechanism, the front frame portion of this. Okay, next slide. There it's coming together. Uh, we I took, my seat off of my vision recumbent, and that's what goes in here now. Uh, part of that was just more, a much more comfortable seat than the one I had originally, and it's quite a bit lighter. The original seat, if you saw it in some of the earlier shots, was actually off of a recumbent trainer, um, and it weighed like 15 pounds because they, they were actually trying to make those heavier so they didn't bounce around your floor, I think. So, <laughs> so here you see the that uh, bike frame now welded to all the bearing plates and the interior frame and all that. All right, next. Now, here's the part about how we change this to, I hope, speed this up. And I haven't been able to test it yet. But you can see that axle sits on that, on all that mechanism. But right in front of where my dad's hand is, you can see a gap in like an upright plate. What that is, is a mechanism where I can now lift this entire axle up about three and a half inches. And that should reposition the paddles in the water at a much better angle. And yet have the paddles still at the far outside edge of the rim. So I haven't been able to test this yet. That's Come, come this spring, I'm going to run this through a lot of tests and try to figure out, you know, the best number of paddles to use, the best size of paddles to use and then use this mechanism. And I'm hoping to speed this up. You know, I'm hoping for between four and five miles an hour with this thing. We'll, we'll see if I can get there. All right, and there's that rebuilt um, mechanism again, the, the, the faux differential and uh, the split axle so I can have both, um, both sides turn independently of each other. All right, next. And there's what I call the scariest jack-o'-lantern ever. My dad welding inside my boat. <laughs> we had we figured out something in there that we needed to attach, and we at that point had had put this all together, and we were 
We're like, we do not want to re disassemble this thing. It was going to, it would take hours to disassemble it. So we just, he just welded inside it and uh, we checked for burn marks. I was really, I was really hoping I wasn't going to start seeing sparks come through the boat and fall to the floor because I didn't know what we were going to do then. Uh, a lot of patching, but it, it, it wasn't bad. All right. Next. And there's the full mechanism, and you can see now the my gears. I have, I have 21 speeds, and my lowest gear ratio is lower than a one to one. I think it's about a 0.7 to one for you know. Again, my big problem is is the weight. So trying to go up hills with this thing is is can be pretty brutal. Uh, and you see the round crossbar or the round uh, bars that Dad was cutting up earlier that go up the inside of the the boat to support the Support the front axle and keep the boat from ever folding up where we cut all the plastic out of it. And then, he, and lastly here, or not, well, uh, is the, here's the, the front axle and how we attach the front wheels. One of the things we, we really watch for is I wanted to make sure that I could source parts out on the road somewhere. So I was out in the middle of nowhere and I could at least find a bike shop uh, and maybe a machine shop, then I could fix most problems on this thing. So these these wheels slide over this three quarter inch cold rolled steel axle. That's the same axle you'd put in a yard tractor. But you know we we joked around. We were we weren't building a Lamborghini. We were building a Jeep. So we made it pretty tough. Um, so this wheel slides over that axle. There's a plug on the inside of that hub that goes through it that holds it and then there's a nut that that screws over that axle that is welded to a cut down disc brake and so we use the disc brake hub there as a, essentially like lug nuts on a car you know so you you screw that in and you line those up and you put all your your disc brake uh, bolts in there and then that is what holds all that together so again that that part can rust you know and uh, it doesn't really matter or get wet and it's not hurting anything so our, we started building it in uh, September 2017 or rebuilding it with all the aluminum this is October 2017 I think October 8th we had it done it the first build took us about three months like 12 build days plus dad just tinkering in the evening without me this one took us less than a month i think it was like six or eight build days total to do this because we already knew where we were going with it randy that, if i could stop you for a second sure. for a couple more questions here yeah. um from uh, mike gsal you want uh, you were talking about uh, riding the recumbent bike and comparing uh, the that to your uh, quad yak. He says concerning the energy use, how many watts were you pushing on the quad yak, or do you push on the quad, quad yak? Do you know? Well, I don't know wattage. Uh, I I don't have a watt meter to do that, but I did uh, just watch heart rate and you know how it figure how a Garmin figures calorie burn. And it essentially says that on, on hilly terrain, at least, I'm burning about twice the calories per mile as in, in the quad yak as I would on the recumbent. Okay. Almost exactly twice as many calories. Okay, yeah, that's a lot. Um, yeah. <laughs> also from uh, Mike, he says, um, instead of steel, uh, did you think of uh, using wood perhaps for some parts? Uh, actually, the first boat had a little bit of wood in it. Where there's the aluminum bars uh, supporting the side now, we had to find a way for that front mechanism to attach to the boat, and we used hedge wood wedges that were along the side of the boat to begin with. But that was the only wooden part we used to begin with. Like I said, when we first built this, it was it was more along the lines of, will this even work at all? So we went to a local fencing company and just bought one inch steel bar and a couple of pieces of two inch. That was like the heavy duty rear uh, part of the, of the rear, rear crossbar was a two inch piece of steel. So we were just kind of like, what's the cheapest, easiest thing that we can build this with the first time. The second time we're like, now let's incorporate 
you know, let's make it lighter. Let's make it better. Let's figure out a way to, to change the uh, angle of attack on those paddles and speed it up and do all those kind of things. So, okay. uh, and, uh, we didn't really, we did, I, I actually didn't consider much wood other than we did use some hedge at the beginning to support the front axle. Okay. Um, also from uh, Dam Runner one uh, very creative use of material. So we're talking about materials. He compliments you on that. And uh, Irv uh, has a couple questions. He asked one earlier, and this one kind of goes along with that. First of all, do you have an idea how much you actually invested in in the build or builds? The two of them, I guess. Um, a couple of thousand dollars. I um, mean, and, and it kind of depends. Like I already had the boat. If you went out and bought that boat, that would be probably an eight hundred to a thousand dollar boat. It's not just a cheap Walmart thing. It's got a it's it's kind of a hybrid. It's not quite an ocean going vehicle, but it's much sleeker than most of your river float boats. Um, so it, that would you would start with probably an eight hundred to a thousand dollar boat. But I already had that, and then. Uh, the first time, again, we, you know, I went and bought, you know, I think seven bikes at garage sales. Uh, and a lot of the, the difficulty was finding like two of them that matched. So I had to find for that rear, the rear forks, I had to find two matching forks to do, to do that. Uh, the second time, then it was more, I, you know, the second time I also, I knew I had more time. I knew dad's shop wasn't going to get rebuilt. So I, I took my time and went on eBay and watched for people that were selling bulk uh, stuff from maybe shut down bike shops. And then you could buy matching forks real easy and buy two of them cheap. You know, I'd, I'd make offers on, Hey, if I buy two of these, can I, you know, buy one, get one 50%, you know, those kind of things. And I saved some money that way. But so the second one actually probably cost a little bit more. Uh, and the aluminum that it, 8020 extruded aluminum, if you bought that new uh, and or just went out and tried to buy it, that would be a, a significant cost. But again, during that year, I was keeping my eye open for stuff. And one day at a garage sale, I spotted a guy that had a whole rack of that stuff in his backyard and talked him out of it and bought it, got, got what's really probably a couple thousand dollars of aluminum for, I bought it for $200. So, so on version two, then, um, Randy, so uh, Denny kind of was asking this. I, I think maybe you're going to get to it anyways, but clearly all the aluminum versus the steel is going to make things a little lighter. Are you going to be talking about this shortly? We just want yeah, to we, about yeah, we can actually talk about it now. Uh, okay. It is a little lighter. We cut about maybe 15, 20 pounds off of it, but we also bulked some stuff up, uh, made it a little stronger. So it didn't cut as much. I was really hoping to get about 40 pounds off of that thing, but it was more like 20. Uh, that that front lifting mechanism added some weight to it. That That's a much more uh, complicated uh, build there. And so that added back that extra 20 pounds that we saved the first time. Um, you know, so yes, the aluminum is lighter, but then we made it a little bit bulkier and made it a little more complicated. So, but I did cut about 20 pounds off of it. So, you know, I think it's about 125 now unloaded where it was about 145 unloaded. That's significant, I think. Okay, yeah. let's get back yeah. to the slideshow if you could. Okay, where, where are we at? Okay, so that's my first ride uh, since the rebuild, October, about October 7th. Okay, next. And here's my turnaround spot. This is, this is a, seven miles away from the house. This is my, my normal, like 14 mile, go to the, go to where the shoulder ends and turn around and come home. Uh, but this is a good shot of the, it rebuilt and you see the aluminum crossbar in the back and, oh, and, and something I didn't mention before above that crossbar in the back, you see a thin, uh, threaded rod that is independent on a car, it'd be independent front wheels, you know, alignment on the back, it's independent rear wheel alignment. So I can independently align those rear wheels uh, to make sure that they're tracking straight. Um, okay, next slide. Uh, this is a ride I did this year uh, in October, the, the Maple Leaf ride. And I ran into some recumbent guys in the background. That's actually 
essentially how you guys found me because when these guys found me they they said hey join our recumbent group and i started going on facebook and joining more and more recumbent groups and posting more stuff uh and so that was fun running into those guys i think that's i think they were from a lot of them were from the recumbent trikes facebook group and i didn't i didn't place <laughs> i'm kind of slow uh, but this was one of the first long rides. I think I did the, uh, well, now I don't remember what this was. Might have been 33 mile ride. I can't remember. Um, okay, next slide. And I also got to ride in our local uh, Maple Leaf Parade. This is the, one of the big things in Carthage, Missouri every year. And it was kind of funny watching uh, about half the people thought this was a clown car, I think. And then half the people understood that it was a, it was a legitimate thing. And the funniest part's always watching kids' realization that it still goes in the water. You know, they they look at it and they it's like, oh, that's kind of cool. And like, wait a minute, those are paddles. Wait, that would actually work. You know, <laughs> it's you know, actually some adults, it takes them a while to get that realization as well. That it's you wouldn't, you know, what I usually tell people when they ask, hey, does that still go in the water? I go, well, you, you wouldn't carry all this extra weight, you know, for nothing. Uh, yes, it still goes in the water. Okay, next slide. And this is the, the screenshot uh, from the only launch I've done this year. I took it in the water once, but you can actually see that's a local small lake, and it's pretty choppy. Uh, it was pretty windy that day, and I didn't have windscreens or wheel wells or anything built yet. Uh, so I just took it out, did a little loop, and came back. But I, I, I had to put it in the water at least once since the rebuild, just, just to see. And actually, I had no pontoons on it, and it seemed to balance better. I believe we've dropped my weight a little bit. I think this seat sits lower than it did on the steel version. Uh, and it actually seems to ride a little better than in the water on this version. Well, I'll see you once I, I end, you know, shaving 20 pounds off of it can't hurt. Can't hurt. All right, next slide. And this is a shot. I'm now getting somewhat celebrity status in my hometown. People now take pictures of me as I ride around town and then and then send them to me or post them on my Facebook. This one, uh, some people took this picture. I, I didn't know them. They didn't know me. But uh, four or five days later, they ran into me on another trail and said, hey, we saw you the other day. Took a picture. And we linked up, you know, so they could send it to me, and I asked them if I could use it for things, and they said, sure. So this is me, me on my way out of Carthage to do one of my rides. So since the rebuild in October, I've put about 350 miles on this total. I, I was doing about 150 a month until the really cold, nasty weather hit Missouri, and now I've slowed down a little bit. But All right, next slide. And this is the, about the latest ride I've done was uh, – we have a local uh, Christmas light, a uh, run through the lights. There's a, a Vietnamese Catholic church that does this phenomenal light show that takes about 20 minutes to drive through in a car. Uh, and one night a week, they open it up for people to walk it and 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 run it and bike ride it. And so this is a shot that it was about, it was about 30 degrees in that picture, I think. And I've decorated the quad deck up with some... Uh, some battery powered Christmas lights as well. And I think that's my, is that my yeah, last Let's finish it up or maybe okay. a couple more okay. shots. Oh, there, I think there, that's there the last shot. Last there. Beautiful. There's, a, there's a shot from the Christmas ride as well. I, it, that's a, it's quite a beautiful ride to do. It was a really Excellent. fun time. It was about 600 people showed up for this, this uh, ride that night. Uh, Ray, walk, some walk, fascinating walk stuff here. Let me, I've got a couple of questions that have come okay. up uh, during uh, your, your talk and a couple from, uh, our panel as well here that I've got, and then I'll open up, see if anybody else has any more. Uh, from Doug Davis, our panelist, Doug Davis, he's got two questions for you. First, sure. can I get one in red? <laughs> and uh, only half in just, you don't know Doug, because he, he probably does. And this also came, uh, the second part of his question is also what Irv asked a little bit earlier uh, when we were talking about uh, how much it costs and such. The question is, what are you planning on doing uh, with with this? So, um, are you going to be selling these? Are you going to be selling plans? Are you just going to be uh, give, putting the plans out there? Give, give us an idea what your idea is uh, for the quad yak. Yeah, um, essentially, I've, I've pretty much already released videos on how to build this. I don't plan on selling plans. 
or selling quad jacks. And in fact, I, I, I asked my dad, like, what if somebody wants to buy one of these? And he was like, no, <laughs> because I didn't build this. I, I, I designed it, but I co-built it. I did all the biking stuff and boating stuff, but, but dad did the welding and the lathe work and the milling machine work. I don't know how to do that. I'm not an engineer. Um, I don't have that kind of skill set. Uh, I'm working on it. I mean, I can do a, a you know a few things here and there, and I'm I'm always trying to add to my skill set. But I could not have built this by myself. And we've kind of agreed that we're we're not going to go into production on these things, unfortunately. But, but for people who are interested, and it seems as though there's quite a few, yeah. they should be able to find out enough from your YouTube videos yes. and if Facebook you, page. Yep. If you watch, if you watch all YouTube videos, I mean, we go into a lot of detail. Um, there are, yes, somebody should be able to follow along. And, you know, I try to point out the reasons why we do things like, you know, front wheel drive is better for climbing ramps. You know, the, the whole three wheel to four wheel thing. I mean, I, I had anticipated one problem, which is that it would drag because the wheels were so far apart, and it did. I didn't anticipate the main problem, which is that tippiness hitting the water. When you went in the water and the nose picked up the front wheels, you were balanced on the front, front of a boat and the rear wheel, and it was, you could just, you know, it actually threw me in the water once as a three wheel. Uh, that all got fixed as a four wheel. But okay. yes, you, somebody should be able to, to follow along, and, I, you know, I kind of, the way I kind of do things is, is, and you mentioned before, I've got a lot of, I got a lot of other ideas. Um, I have a, a whole list of projects that I'm working on now that I'm getting to. Some are recumbent, some are human powered, other kind of things and solar and wind and water. And I mostly plan to just let people have those ideas. Um, I, I will post those as I get them. I, I don't really ever want to try to want them. I'm not trying to make money on this. I do have a Patreon page in case people want to help me build this stuff. Like I said, I'll go out and make the mistakes first, and then you guys can copy what I do later. <laughs> and and uh, Randy has a video that I watched not long ago. I think it's a recent one, Randy, where you you hold up little cards with drawings <laughs> for like 100 and, yeah. 101. Well, I, one of my playlists on, on YouTube is called 101 Great Ideas, and I legitimately have over 100 ideas. I just called it 101. That video, I think I showed 25 ideas in 17 minutes. And some of our progressions of, I want to build this first, and then that helps me build this thing, and then that converts into this. Uh, what, like the thing I'm mostly working on right now, actually, while, while I was waiting. Uh, because he can't help himself, folks. Yeah, if he's got a second, he's going to, yeah. Somebody gave me 20 of these batteries, uh, lead acid, 12 volt rechargeable batteries. And those are going to go in, uh, building kind of a recumbent human power and solar hybrid power station. So you will be able to pedal and charge batteries, you know, a generator, and then a solar roof, that'll charge batteries, and then take that power station, put it in a boat, now you got an electric boat. Put it on wheels, you got an electric cart. Put it beside your RV and keep your deep cycle batteries charged up and let you stay in the wilderness for longer or almost indefinitely by charging your deep cycle systems back up. Okay, Randy. Let's, uh, you know what, you, uh, obviously we're going to have to have you come back on when you start working on these. We, yeah, otherwise yeah. we'll be doing, uh, you know, six hour shows here. With yeah, yeah. You. So uh, I would love to have, let's kind of, uh, let's kind of finish things up here. A couple of quick things. Uh, Irv uh, Rish says, we should have had your dad on the show, uh, which probably <laughs> next yeah. time maybe we will have your dad. That's uh, and uh, Ken Kaiser. I, I greatly admire the free sharing of your quad yak build. The giving spirit seems to flow throughout the trike community and the recumbent community. I think, and yeah. uh, a good point uh, from our friend Ken. Um, and I'd like so, to point out, you know, when I first started this, like I had the design and I knew what I wanted to do, and I I went onto recumbents.com on their forums. And posted my design. I think even some early photos. There's some forum posts of me on that. Um, and the community was very supportive and came along and said, "Oh, good design." And yeah, have you thought of this? And you know those kind of things. And actually pointed me towards a build that was very similar to the design that I had. A guy out of Oregon about 15 years ago did something very similar with a canoe, um, and that, that was very helpful. So I'm, I'm kind of giving back the 
the inclusion that I felt early on as a newbie, uh, I kind of felt like I should give that back as well and just share these these ideas right. out there. We're all standing on the shoulders of somebody, I think. <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. All right. Let's finish up. Uh, I, I don't want to leave you without uh, talking to you about your future plans with the Quad Yak, which I think are really fascinating. Yeah. So you have actually this uh, epic trip plan <laughs> for next yeah. year. So, Randy, tell us all what is it you have in mind with well, the Quad Yak for next year? Yep. In, the, in 2018, the summer 2018, I hope to take this across the United States. Uh, it's I'm working on the, the details and the logistics of it, but I usually, when I start something like this, I usually at least attempt it. I'm not sure if I can, if I can do it or not, but I, I'm going to try. Uh, I plan to go out to the coast of Oregon and come inland to about Casper, Wyoming, get in the Platte River, take the Platte River to Nebraska, to the Great Bend, drop south from there to the Arkansas River, follow the Arkansas to where it meets the Mississippi, take that down to around Vicksburg and head over to the Pearl and maybe the Pascagoula River, which takes me to the Gulf, go across Alabama, Mississippi, and hit Florida and where Florida starts to bend down, cross the state and end hopefully in about St. Augustine. That's the general idea. I figure 100 riding days at 32 miles a day. Uh, that's a good average from the other two trips I did. That's about where I'd average about 30, 35. Uh, my, my longest day was actually that picture on the Trail of the Coeur d'Alene. I did 74 miles in one day on a flat paved surface. Well, so, Randy, I got to say that this is a, a amazing <laughs> trip that you have planned. I, I'm always surprised by what people, uh, how people correct me when I'm wrong, but I, I got to say, I don't know if anyone's ever done something quite like this. And I, uh, intend to follow you myself. I uh, hope that our viewers will as well. And uh, yeah, besides having you back on for some other uh, great ideas of yours and builds, uh, I think maybe we'll, if we can, we'll hook up with you while you're uh, on this trip, maybe for a, a short bit during a show and see how you're doing yeah. and check in. Yeah. Monthly updates while I'm on the trip this summer, you know, I mean, you throw five minutes on, on the, on the show and go, Hey, remember that guy? Well, now he's in this state and he's done this and this. So that'd yeah, be a it's, an, it's an incredible feat. Uh, and uh, just building it is. And uh, and the trip that you have planned, I, I think, is just uh, re remarkable. So we will look Thank forward you. to that. All right. So did uh, any final thoughts, uh, Randy, at, before? Um, oh, wait. I want to show you one other thing. I got the okay. coolest thing yesterday. A guy from a local maker space in Joplin, Missouri, a young man by the name of Daniel, made me a 3D printed quad yak. I just got this yesterday. It's a little rough. Uh, he had some problems with his machine, but it's 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 the quad that yak. really scale. cool. I know, I just got this yesterday. I'm so happy with this thing. Now I gotta get some paint out and paint it up and do that. So I wanna do that. And you're gonna share, um, I, uh, I've i got, so the, the quad yak has its own uh, Facebook page and I have uh, a YouTube channel which is actually called uh, Stereo Randy, but it has the Quad Yak has its own playlist. And Stereo Randy is also my Patreon name, Patreon slash Stereo Randy. And the Patreon account, if anybody, you know, people want to support, that will help with like the trip across the United States, will help with my future builds. Uh, it's all just, you know, people want to help me build this stuff and help me do these weird trips with them because almost everything I build then has a goal in the future, like, you know, take this thing up the, up the Mississippi river and, or you do something like that. So that's what that, that Patreon uh, uh, page is for is anybody wants to help me with my insanity, then cool. <laughs> Sounds great. Well, we, uh, we will continue to follow the intriguing ideas that you come up with uh, both in terms of builds and travels. And we appreciate so much you uh, coming on with us today to let people see what you do, Randy. So thank you so very much. Please stay with us if you have the time uh, for the rest of the show. And, uh, thanks and, for having and me thanks. on, Gary. We will, yeah, uh, we, will put, we will put those links, of course, in the description of the video uh, uh, in the future so people can find you. So thanks a lot, Randy. Thanks for having me on, Gary. All right, folks, we're going to move along now to uh, upstate New York where ensconced in his shop right now don't forget to unmute yourself peter 
Otherwise, we will not uh, gain anything from the words of wisdom. Hello. There you are. You with us? I'm with there you. There we go. There is Peter Stoll, the bicycle man. Yeah, in his shop. And uh, as I mentioned at the top of the show, Peter is going to be with us on a routine basis, I think, for a while, talking about some recumbent bike history. He has given talks about this before and has a little slideshow to share with us. We're going to talk about the amazing um, historic uh, recumbent bikes that he has behind him there, uh, up above his head. Yeah, there we go. So, uh, Peter, thanks for coming on uh, from Alfred Station, New York. And uh, let's let's hear what you have to say about the history of recumbent bike. Well, thank you. You know, everybody seems to think that recumbent bikes are a new idea. But if we go to the first slide, we'll see they started in the 1800s. And Trey, can you get that? There we go. Okay, this is called the Charlin recumbent. Don't know how you pronounce that. Um, you'll find, I believe it's not a photograph and it's not done to scale very well. Uh, I've suggested to somebody that maybe it's an artist's uh, concept and it was never constructed, but apparently it was constructed. But you'll notice that this person has no chance of reaching the ground from that seat. But this is in the 1800s sometime. I've, you can look it up online, Charland, C-H-A-R-L-A-N-D, I believe. It's 1880 or something like that. Uh, next slide. Okay, this is a bike that was reviewed in a magazine in 1905. It's in England, and it's a production bike. So who who knew there was a production recumbent with below seat steering in 1905? But although this is a photograph, I would also suggest how in the world did she reach the ground from that seat? <laughs> I'm not at all clear. And you know, doesn't the seat over on the right half of the picture there, doesn't it look like it came from an Adirondack guide boat or something? I'm not sure. Next slide. This is a bike from the teens that's, I believe, in France. Next slide. This is called the Easy Chair Bicycle, and the, the magazine review says it's clearly designed for comfort, not for speed. Uh, this is in 24, I believe. Next slide. This bike is a Velo car, a uh, street version of a Velo car. Next slide. Now we have a racing velo car which set a world record. So much for built for comfort and not for speed. This is 1933. Next slide. This is the start of the race. And I like the guy, you know, there's the recumbent in the center there. And then the guy next is looking at the bike and not where he's going. And they're like, what? <laughs> and then they started the race. You set a world record. And the next year they outlawed them from competition. We've seen this happen repeatedly. Next slide. Okay, this is a ceiling of our shop, and uh, so you know that so far that was just a real quick run over the history of recumbent bikes very very quickly. I'm going to go through the collection a little bit here and just kind of give an overview of what's up in the future. We're going to do things like uh, like we'll talk about the early American recumbents that started in you know the late '70s or so, and we'll talk about the early trikes, and we'll talk about a variety of different below seat steering bikes. And we'll talk about racing bikes, you know, we'll do different topics and stuff like that. We'll also get some bikes off the ceiling and look at individual bikes that are particularly interesting or whatever like that. So next slide. This is a 1975 trike that we got in. Uh, and if I were to think quick, I would think of the name of it, but I guess I'm not gonna get that there at the moment. It's a long wheelbase. It has extremely low ground clearance. It's kind of fun to ride. There's it's no mass, way to jump the leg length. It's a massive Sling. slingshot. Massive Sling. slingshot. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's it just riding around our parking lot. It drags on the ground, but it is fun to ride. And there's no way to adjust for leg length, so it fits me perfectly. Brian, you'll you'll love it. Next question. Next slide. This is a 1978 Tour Easy. And uh, it's a one-owner bike. The guy brought it in and gave it to me. If he, he said, I'll give it to you if you'll collect it. So I collect. That was the first one in the collection, I believe. Next slide. This is a 1980 wow. uh, Avatar 2000. And this happens to be the first we're coming to ride in Paris, Brest, Paris. This one is certainly going to get a whole, a whole segment sometime. Next. 
okay, this is a Corsa trike and it is heavy. The frame's aluminum, but it's got enough fiberglass on it. It's quite heavy and it really doesn't ride well at all. We got a couple of them. One's red, one is black. We call them Batman and Robin. They were mid eighties. Next slide. There it is before we hung it up. Next slide. Okay, this is a roulette made in, uh, I think it's Dutch. And it rides amazingly well. I was amazed how, uh, that the seat wasn't more uncomfortable. It's really, if you look at the seat, it, it looks like a, I think it's a plastic chair. And there are three slots in the back of it, and the frame tube protrudes from one of these slots. And I would think that would be horribly uncomfortable, but it's, it's you know, it's uncomfortable, but it's not, it's not as bad as a triathlon bike. It handles really well. They say it's the first production recumbent, but that first trike we looked at, the massive slingshot, that is even, like 10 years older or something. And it, they, the, that was, that's going to get a whole segment too. That was a uh, 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 Japanese company came up with that, and they came up with their, a new type of racing, and the rules were so strict that only their bike could enter. <laughs> Hey, there's an idea. Next slide. This is the aptly named Hypercycle. It is, look at the wheelbase of that thing. It is hyper. And this one's a prototype. You'll notice the front derailleur tube's not at the correct angle. Uh, it's a, the componentry is quite old. So I think we date this as the early 80s. 82, I think is what we say. Now, all, you know, all through this segment and other segments, I'm going to say the date of a bike and lots of times I'm guessing. Okay. So don't take me as the ultimate authority. Next slide. This is a bike. Uh, I'll give you a little story about this one. Uh, the guy that designed this, uh, Steve Lightgen, was riding across uh, Ragbri on his, he built frames light gin cycles and he was riding a, a time trial bike that he built and and he got passed by a lady in a tour easy in you know the fifth rag bri or something like that and he went home and designed and built this uh, later on he was instrumental in the design of linear recumbents uh, so that's sort of interesting to me because we bought light linear recumbents uh, next slide and this is the first linear recumbent ever to be sold. And we, we always tell the story that it was owned by uh, Michael Tilton Thomas, the composer and conductor, I guess conductor more than composer. And he kept it as Martha's Vineyard house, but we never ever tell anyone that he left it in the house when he sold it. We don't tell anyone that story. No, that's definitely verboten. This one is so early, uh, the, the con name on the side of it, that's the name of a company that made aluminum garbage trucks. And the little head sticker on it says light gen cycle. So it's a, at this point they hadn't come up with a linear name and really decided to go into production. And those are the largest ape hanger handlebars I've seen. Next slide. This is a uh, Rand Stratus. And notice the controls, the rear brake and the rear derailleur are mounted on a pod in front of the seat. Maybe that's because they couldn't find tandem brake gear cables. I'm not sure. I'll have to I'll have to research that a little further. Next slide. This is a the the first prototype back saver. They donated that to us uh, when they heard we had a museum. Uh, the the seat is patented, and it was later purchased by Sun Recumbents, who manufactured a heavier and cheaper version for a while. Next. Slide. Uh, okay, this is the uh, oh, it's American made, made in the Midwest. Let me. I'm going to stand up and walk around here, and then I can actually look at the signs on the ceiling where I've written all this stuff down. Infinity. That makes it. Uh, it's no, a it's Felice, not infinity. Isn't it? No, oh, okay. It's a defelice. Ding ding ding. We it's have a winner. Felice. That is a defelice. <laughs> and. Uh, Below seat steering, very robust looking, small production, I believe. Next slide. Oh, well, let me also say these slides are pretty much in, in chronological order, as near as I can guess. This is a land speeder. Uh, it's a production version, a road version of a race bike. 
that was raced by Eric Hyden in Indianapolis in the HPVA. I have not been able to find a record of that race except on the website of the designer of the land speeder. Who signed that, Peter? Uh, the designer. That's um, a designer. Yeah, I can. Okay. Let me read the sign off that beastie. No, nope, didn't sign that one yet. Okay, never mind. Next slide. Above seat steering make. Hey, there's a vintage bike. This is the first linear with below seat steering. This is uh, uh, Steve Lightchen's personal bike. We, he traded it for a new welded linear frame set. He did ragbri like 15 times on this bike or something. Next bike. This is an early production linear, not a whole lot different. It does have seat struts in the back, which I think is a good addition. Next slide. This is an early Ryan, an 86 Ryan. Uh, somebody contacted us and said, uh, you know, I've got this old Ryan and, and maybe, you know, would I, if I, would you give me a hundred bucks for it and pay the freight if I shipped it to you? Maybe somebody could use it for parts. And it got here and it, it was in really good shape. So we, we paid him more than that. He was delighted. He was really happy to hear that it was going up in the ceiling and it's, it's right up here at the moment. Can you see it there? So we're going to do a series one time on the Avatar, the Ryan, and the long bikes. And, and we'll throw a little linear in the middle because they, they're clearly uh, one saw the next and they one led to the other. If we say we're all standing on the shoulders of somebody. Next slide. Okay, this is the brass band. It's a one of a kind. I know nothing about it at all. But the front tire is a sew-up. And with a 26-inch wheel, who needs that chain ring? <laughs> yeah, okay. Next slide. This is the row bike. Yeah, it's, you steer it by leaning the seat side to side and uh, it's, it's controllable on uphills. <laughs> Next slide. This is an infinity. Uh, it's steered with two, two wires connecting the handlebar to the fork, but so is the DeFelice. I thought the infinity was the first of those. I thought the infinity was the only one. Next slide. This is a little newer linear, not much visible difference here. Next slide. This is a P38, a Lightning P38 with below seat steering. So, uh, yeah, they did that. They made a half a dozen of those. Let me go read the sign just for grins. There, it is uh, one of three or four, according to Lightning. That's what Tim Brummer told me. Next slide. Uh, that is a uh, newer black Ryan Vanguard, which we've taken off the ceiling and done a little work on, and we're going to be putting that on our used bike for sale page pretty soon. Next slide. This is an ice strike. It was called Crystal Engineering. It's a 1992. Ice says that's the first year that one of those was uh, uh, the first year that they sent a bike to the U.S. So conceivably, this is the first ice in the, in the U.S. But it was called Crystal Engineering at that time. Then it was changed to Trice, and then now it's become Ice. Next slide. A bikey. It's a 1993, the first production year. Look at that fork. Isn't that unique? Next slide. This is a, a Easy One, which we all know from uh, the Taiwanese bikes that Sun's imported. But this one's made in California by Gardner Martin. There's a story behind that. Uh, we're going to have to do a series on uh, Gardner Martin here one day. Next slide. This is a vision. You can't go anywhere without a vision, right? They've been around for a long time. Next slide. And this is a Presto. Hey, Brian, where did I get this one? That used to be mine. Yes. I got it. I got it and then found out it was a rare prototype and thought it would be better in your, uh, your museum. <laughs> And we appreciate that. It's one of the prototypes here. And it folds. It's not the first fold we come with the linears fold. Next slide. All right. Brian, what's this one? That's a Reynolds Nomad, right? It's the Nomad. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah. Whoa, he's good, isn't he? That's yeah. a Reynolds Nomad. As a matter of fact, let's do a little segment on Reynolds bikes while we're here. Come All right. There you monitor you. Okay, first we need a story about, about Reynolds. You ready, Brian? I'll do this very, very quickly. Um, this is a quick story. So uh, George Reynolds was, is, he's still around, 
awesome, amazing guy. One of those guys I like to describe, he looks like he could not be harmed by conventional weapons. He's just like a very tough, <laughs> tough guy, you know? And we were sitting around the fire at the, one of the bent rides years and years ago. I'm going to say 2005 or something like that. He showed up with a Dodge Aries K station wagon with a roof <laughs> rack welded onto the roof. That's yep. just George. What works, works. He doesn't care if it's pretty. That's just how he was. But we're sitting around talking. And he said, a, he told this story about like he play he goes, I play in this over 50 hockey league. He's from New, Ham uh, is it New Hampshire, right? Uh, Southern New Hampshire. Yeah, New Hampshire. And he had that accent. I played in this over 50 hockey league. And uh, this, they were playing the game one night and he checked somebody. They checked him back. And the, he goes, and the guy dropped his gloves like he wanted to fight. I couldn't believe it. It's a over 50 hockey league. I couldn't believe he wanted to fight. And I go, well, and we're all just like, well, what happened? And he goes, oh, I knocked him out. Like that was a foregone conclusion. Like it wasn't like, <laughs> you know, like it wasn't like, a, like a, it was just like, oh, I knocked him out. He, he used to be an army ranger. He's just the toughest human being you ever met. And he made some really cool, but very eccentric bikes. Eccentric bikes, yes. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, let's start with this nomad up here. This is an above seat steering nomad. Hang, hang on a second. There we go. Well. Go ahead. Yeah, see, it's, that's big eight hanger handlebars and a nomad frame. And then we'll move down to this one. This is the one in the, the picture that you had on the slide. This is the below seat steering nomad. Hey, Brian, look, the steering linkage isn't a threaded rod. That must have been a later high tech model. Well, you recognize the, the seat covered in uh, AstroTurf. AstroTurf, you love the AstroTurf. Yeah, it's actually, it's more comfortable than you'd think. It works. And the seat, the seat pan for this here, he uh, goes out in the backyard where there's an old tractor with a metal seat and he lays some fiberglass on the tractor seat. And after he comes out in the morning, I guess after it's cured, he pops the, the, uh, the, the fiberglass off of there. But he switched to carbon seats because he said that he discovered about half the fabrication time in building a bike was making the seat. So he switched. Now this is would be called uh, Reynolds Classic, which means the frame is handmade out of chromoly sheet. All cut up and all welded back together. You can see it's gusseted here and there. And he's an amazing fabricator. The other thing that's really amazing about George was that he set world records, you know? One time I was talking to George and I was working with college students working on the linear design. And I said, hey, George, uh, what kind of software do you use? What file format do you, can you generate? Because I'm wondering if maybe we could, you know, do FEA on your drawings and, and help you with some structural uh, uh, analysis and stuff, you know? And he said, well, I have a life-size cardboard a uh, two-dimensional model of myself that hinges at the joints and I lay it on a big piece of cardboard on the floor and I put it, you know, move it through the pedaling positions and where do I want the hands and I draw on the, and I said, no, no, we can't import that file format. So then his more famous bikes, more recent bikes, this is actually an earlier one, but this is a short wheelbase, kind of rough condition. Notice the Handlebar cross tube here is airfoil shaped. I don't know if you can see it there, but it's definitely airfoil shaped. And a little earlier seat is how I'm dating this as being earlier than the other. And this would be a wishbone classic, right? This would be a prototype of a wishbone classic. And then some of the ideas I got from the wishbone classic, I raced a wishbone classic in Montreal one time. And George, you know, he, uh, he just totally ate my lunch. There were three races. In the first race, he came in first. In the second race, he came in first. I came in second both times. And then the third race, I won't go into details, but it was complicated and the directions were given in French and translated poorly to English. And I got the directions wrong, but I was out of the race. It was the last man out and I was out before it mattered. Uh, George wasn't and George was disqualified. So it turns out that two seconds and a first is more points than two firsts and a DNF. So I won. Yeah, like heck I won. He, he cleaned my clock every time they fired the gun. But some of the things I learned from this bike 
have gone into this bike, which is a uh, new linear roadster. So, you know, there's uh, people learn from each other. You know, that's how that works. Standing on shoulders once again. Yeah, standing on shoulders. So let's go back to the slideshow. And, All right, uh, yeah, let's kind of wrap it up. Again we'll wrap here. it up. Out of time. Next slide. Okay, there's the short wheelbase. Next slide. That's another Reynolds. Okay, that's the above seat steering Reynolds with the Nomad. Next slide. This is a Halusic Traverse with full suspension. Does anybody know who made aluminum grip shifts that could be anodized blue? Because that's what this bike has got. White Next. Industries. Oh, really? White Industries? Well, I've never yeah. had an answer to that. I should have known Brian would be the one to ask. They were, brief, they were briefly called another name that is not politically correct, so they, uh, they got rid of that. They were briefly called White Power, and they decided to change their name. Uh, <laughs> well, no. <laughs> oh, but there's some, some, some real good people there, don't you know? Next slide. This is the 146th TerraTrike ever built. And we'll probably do a segment on trikes, so we'll talk about this one more later. Next slide. Uh, we'll do a segment on the Giant Revive, the Trek R200, and the Cannondale Bent 1. This is what happens when big companies think they can make a recumbent. So far, they have not proven it to be marketable. Next slide. I think we're done, aren't we? Nope, not cool. Okay, aha, uh -huh. oh, there's one more. This is a Makaido. They weren't a big company, but they didn't build much of like either. Somebody traded this in because they didn't like riding it, and uh, I decided that when we build an addition in the shop, we'll have room to hang this on the ceiling. And I think we're done now. Is there one more? Oh, we're back to the road bike again, yeah. Yeah, we had a that couple thing of those, is I think. bizarre. Someday we're thinking about having a – uh, a classic or come and ride. We'll get down a dozen of these bikes and go out and, you know, ride to a pub or something. Brian, Brian's, it was Brian's idea. So I'll blame him. Let's see who breaks down first. There you go. <laughs> All right. I think that is the last slide then, Peter. There you go. We're done. Thank you much. Thank you so very much. That's wonderful. That's a great start. So we'll just give a little overview of uh, the great collection and uh, vast knowledge that uh, Peter has on the subject. <laughs> So we're going to go more into depth as he comes back uh, on the next show. We'll pick up some subjects and uh, delve into them a little deeper. So I hope you'll stick with us for those. And Peter, thank you so much for uh, for putting this together and 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 being a part of the Layback Bike Report for the next, uh, oh, however many it takes. Well, thank you. All right. Thanks. All right. Now let's move right to uh, Brian, if we can. He's got his news report uh, having to do with the uh, awards from uh, Bent Rider uh, the, from last year. Brian, go ahead and take it away. Hey, everybody. Yeah, this was uh, we always do on January 1st. We announce our best of the previous year. Uh, just to give an overview of kind of how the rules of this work, because every time we do these, people say, oh, it should have been this. It should have been that. So these are only the only bikes that qualify are stuff that were released and widely available in the year of 2017. So if they they're not, I will, they'll be in the next year. So that's how we do it. How we do it, we have a seven vote system. We let our readers vote. That's one of the seven votes, whatever you guys pick. We have uh, Larry and myself each get a vote, the editors of the website. We have uh, two dealers that uh, we use. And uh, what am I up to now? That's five. And then uh, we have a couple of, uh, uh, we use one other mystery blogger who I don't think it's a mystery who that other blogger is because there aren't many other ones here. You, you may have just seen him a moment ago. But uh, we, don't, we don't release who the dealers are. We like them to be anonymous. We always try and choose dealers that sell all, all the stuff that we're, that we're nominating so they're not biased one way or the other. But anyway, let's get on to the winners. First up, we have the Bike of the Year. This category was not close this year. It won uh, five out of the seven votes. It is the Cruise Bike S40. Very cool, very versatile. It's, it's, they, they took the old Silvio and they kind of made the seat just a bit more upright, not too much. It can take much fatter tires now. It can accommodate more off-the-shelf triple crank sets and things like that. Comes with disc brakes. Very versatile, I think easiest to ride of all the cruise bikes. Great, great bike. Uh, I'm 
that this is the only one that I got right, I will say, <laughs> in the voting. So uh, someone else here got all three. I don't know if he wants to brag about it. Do you want to brag about it? No, actually, two of you did. Oh, you're muted, Gary. I gave it away. Anyway, yeah. So Gary, I think Gary and Larry got all three right, but I only got one right. So of course, yeah, that's uh, the way it is. So let's go on to the next one. Trey. Wait, am I really muted? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. Oh, yeah, I don't know what happened. There. Okay, yeah, but, sorry. Go ahead. Yes, Gary got, got all. Three, Gary got right? all three. Thank you, uh, Brian, for uh, for inviting me to to be a part of this. It's a yeah, pleasure yeah, yeah, and yeah. Honor, so. Yeah, and it's great. I'll yeah. try to get three or four or five right next time, too. Yeah, well, God, I hope we don't have that many. It's going to take a lot of time. <laughs> I have to count all these votes on New Year's Eve. So this is what my New Year's Eve is, is counting votes. All right. Next up, Trike of the Year. This was very close. This is the first time we had to use a tiebreaker. We had to use it for the winner, the Green Speed Arrow. So, yeah, uh, very cool trike. Very fast, low, lean. It was tied. It did not. Uh, but then someone else won the uh, reader vote. The Territrike Gran Turismo actually won the reader vote, but that was the only category that it did. So we had to go down to who finished higher between this and the Catrike Road AR. This is the one that won. More of you guys voted for this than for the Road AR. So by a narrow margin, but well deserved, the Green Speed Arrow. Very cool, very fast trike. I know Larry has one and loves it. I had one uh, for a little while, and it was very, very cool. Very nice trike. So congratulations to Ian Simpson Green Speed. I want to say, surprisingly, that's the first Green Speed that's ever won trike of the year. I want to say. I'm pretty sure. I haven't gone back through the archives, but I'm pretty sure. Next up, we have Accessory of the Year. This one was also a pretty much landslide victory to the Ethneo drive which is a three speed uh kind of crank set drive it is not a i usually say recumbent specific accessory in the rules it is not recumbent specific you can put it on another bike but the uh, importer to the united states is trident trikes and fneo themselves said they sell like 80 percent of them to recumbent people so we're going to call it recumbent specific even though you can't put it on their bike but it's a it's a cool drive it works very well much cheaper than a schlump or something like that if you want it still has a cable but it's uh, still pretty much you know an internally geared kind of thing so it's a it's very very cool very cool product and lastly i had to give an honorable mention and this takes just a moment of explanation we did not have an electric assist category this year but we will next year i'm just trying to figure out how to do that exactly because a lot of electric assist trikes are just regular production trikes with e-assist stuff added to them so i'm like eh, i don't know i'm gonna do it but if we would have had that category this year this would have won the terra trike rambler evo three grand for a very well integrated system that's super easy to use i uh, it, it's a really cool trike and i really really liked it i couldn't really nominate it for uh you know I, a trike of the year because i like the great the grand turismo was more of a hit but i do kind of think that um i know people are selling a ton of these and if we had an e-assist category it would have won so that's why i gave it an honorable mention so that's it for that I, I, and so thank you guys so much for voting i really do appreciate it we get i think this year i got about five thousand votes if i remember correctly so we get a whole lot of votes from everybody and we really do appreciate it. I think it's a fun thing for everybody at the end of the year. You're sitting around, you got nothing else to do on Christmas time. So we put them out like the 15th or 20th and you got till the end of the year to vote and we announced it on the first. So thank you guys very much for voting. And I hope you guys like who won. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, and it is. I, I know the, I know the people that vote uh, really get into it. Certainly the uh, manufacturers get into it. They, uh, yeah, they, they campaign a bit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. get out there. Please vote for us. It's a, it's a really fun thing that you do there. I so. like the campaigning, though. It doesn't bother me a bit. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's that's all fair, I think. So, all right. Appreciate it, Brian. Okay, I think uh, at this point, we're going to go to the contest. So, you guys have seen uh, most of the content of the show. I'm going to ask you four questions, and we'll see who, uh, who can answer these things. You're going to send your answers again to... Uh, laidback bike report at gmail.com. Here are the questions. Number one, what is the name of the amphibious bent that Randy has built? What was that name of the vehicle that he put together? Number two, in what town can you find the bicycle man's bent museum? Where is the bicycle man? Give us the town. Number three, 
Who are the three sponsors that make this webcast possible? Who are our three sponsors? And number four, what is the Bent Rider Recumbent Accessory of the Year? The Bent Rider Recumbent Accessory of the Year. Brian just, uh, just gave you that answer just a few minutes ago. So if you can uh, answer those questions, uh, email us, laidbackbikereport at gmail.com. And I'll take a look at those while uh, Denny's doing his sports report, see if we can come up a winner for you. And at this time, let's go ahead and go to Denny, if we can. And uh, Denny, thanks uh, for doing the report today. Give, give everybody the results and what's coming up uh, in the sports, if you would. Sure. Yeah, I've got my microphone on, right? You are good. Yeah, all right. Results of the Florida Senior, <clears throat> senior Games races in Terra Verde. Florida on the weekend of December 7th and 8th. Boy, my voice is starting to go. This, this winter is really, it's started early and, and staying there. The 5K recumbent is uh, male 50 to 59 with Steve Olson. Male 60 to 64 was Brian Stevens. Male 65 to 69 was Mickey Weiss. And male 75 to 79 was Gary Smith. And in a 10K recumbent race, the male 50 to 54 was Christian Eberle. The 50 to 55 was Stephen Olson. The male 60 to 64 was Brian Stevens. Uh, the male 65 to 69 was Mickey Weiss. And the male 75 to 79 was Gary Smith. Congratulations to all the winners and all those who participated. The upcoming events now, the College Station Texas Senior Games are including recumbent bikes and trikes in their races this year. This will be separate classes for recumbent bikes and recumbent trikes. If you will be age 50 or, or older by December 31st, 2018, you can participate in the games. Age groups are set up in five-year increments, 50 to 54, 55 to 59, uh, and on up to age 70 and above. Men and women have separate divisions. They are the 5K and 10K time trial, 20K and 40K road races. The dates are February 24th and 25th. There is an entry fee, but it includes a t-shirt and two tickets to the celebration on Saturday night. This looks like an excellent opportunity to do some recumbent racing. On the Recumbent Trike Facebook page, there are already 30 riders already registered with both with two and three wheel bikes. If you aren't a member of the Recumbent Trike page and have a recumbent trike, it'd be a good time to join the group. Gary will have the links to the Senior Games website and the Facebook Recumbent Trikes group in the description section of this video. Now, there will be two uh, UMC sanctioned races in February. The first race of the year will be in Texas the weekend of February 2nd and 3rd. The Pace Bend Ultra is a 6, 12, and 24-hour race located 30 minutes west of Austin, Texas at Pace Bend Park. The race is a hilly 6.2-mile loop and features smooth asphalt and stunning views of Lake Travis. The registration is open in the 24-hour race drafting race. I'm sorry, the 24-hour non-drafting race is a Ram qualifier, an event in the Texas Ultra Cup Series. Please note the space is limited, and to protect non-drafting integrity of the event, the race is limited to 100 riders. The following weekend, February 10th and 11th, is the Bike Sebring 1224 in Timed Century. This marks the 19th year of the event in Sebring, Florida. Uh, it attracts riders from all over the country and the world. It's one of the largest fields in ultra cycling. And in a 24 non-drafting race, it is a Ram qualifier. The four races all start at the famous Sebring International Raceway and circle the track for three, the first three laps. The race does an out and back to Frostproof, Florida on open roads. And upon returning the track area, the 12 and 24 hour races spend the rest of the day on an open road 11.7 mile course doing as many laps as they can until the track is opened back up for the rest of the event. The 12 hour racers circle the track all night. It's a unique and well run event sponsored by the Rotary Club of the Highlands in Seabrook, Florida. Finally, if you have an interest in doing long distance riding, I highly recommend trying some randonneuring. This season kicks off in January with Reve rides, weekends in Arizona, California, Georgia, Louisiana, and Florida. 
Brevets are an excellent opportunity to test your equipment, fitness, and resolve. While not a race, they are timed events, and the goal is not to get there first, but to just get there. Often you will rub shoulders with some really good ultra cyclists out looking for some friendly training miles. You can find out more by going to the Randonneuring USA website listed in the comments section of the show. So that's about it for this month. If you know an event we should be try to cover, please contact us here at the Laid Back Bike Report. Until next time, stay on the bike and keep moving forward. Back to you, Gary. All right, Denny, thank you so much for the update there. Appreciate it. All right, folks, uh, let me, if I could, recap our sponsors for this show who have made this all possible. I want to thank, first of all, TerraCycle. Check out their unique bags and purple sky flags. And trailside.bike. If you find yourself in Florida near the Withlacoochee Trail, stop in to see Andrew and his crew. And Velocity, builders of performance wheels and rims, handmade in the USA. Okay, folks, well, I haven't had a great response to the contest. It was probably a little difficult. So I think what I'm going to do is extend the contest uh, um, for probably the rest of the day or two. So uh, even people that start watching the video, uh, and maybe not uh, watching live, will be able to participate. And we'll, again take the first uh, the first timed uh, email that we get with the four correct answers. And um, you know what? Let me just go ahead and repeat those real quickly. Here are the contest questions. What is the name of the amphibious bent Randy has built? In what town can you find the Bicycle Man's Bent Museum? Who are the three sponsors that make this webcast possible? And what is the Bent Rider Recumbent Accessory of the Year? All right, so those are the questions. Go ahead if you're watching it live or if you're watching the video afterwards, go ahead and shoot it to laidbackbikereport at gmail.com. I'll take a look at it and uh, I will post it on uh, probably on the Facebook page, uh, the winners, and uh, get the prizes out to you. All right, uh, let's move to the closing of the video. At this point, I want to remind everybody that we have uh, on the description, uh, usually below the video, as you see here, a clickable table of contents. Uh, this, is a, this allows you to take a long program like we just have and, uh, and click right to the section that you'd like to watch uh, if you're gonna watch it in parts because it's long, easy way to get around the video. Clickable table of contents and then below that, I'm gonna have all the links mentioned in the show as we talked about earlier. So you'll be able to find Randy and you'll be able to find Peter and all the stuff that we talk about in the show, all those links available to you, every description of every show. Uh, I do that right after the show ends. So in a, uh, a couple hours, you'll see that pop up below the video screen. All right. And also, if you want to know about what's coming up next month, uh, it will be February 18th. Uh, we'll at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to have Paul Elkins. This is a guy that I've been following for a long time. Another in a series of do-it-yourself bent guys, uh, kind of like Randy. This guy uh, does some other things. He has built his own recumbent uh, bikes and trikes, uh, even like pedal cars. Uh, he has made all sorts of trailers and um, RV trailers that are hauled by the bikes. Really, really amazing guy. Um, so you'll want to tune in to see Paul a good guy to, to to watch. And of course, we'll have Peter, I think, next month as well, talking about a specific segment of bent history. Um, for next month, uh, we are going, the, the reason the show turns out to be a little bit late, come on back to me, uh, if you would, uh, Trey. Thank you. Yeah. Next month, uh, we are going to be heading down to Florida, as we usually do in the winter time. Uh, get a little relief from the cold weather here and visit some people. Uh, we're going to visit some uh, manufacturers. We're going to do some riding. We're going to ride with the Crabs uh, a, a group again and uh, the Bent Society of Southern Florida, some good folks down there that we've ridden with before and really enjoy riding with. We're going to, like I say, visit uh, some manufacturers and shops. Uh, we're going to be covering the Sebring uh, HPV races. Uh, 
that uh, Denny mentioned to you. So Sebring is uh, a race that I'd never been to before, even though I've been in Florida a couple of times during the winter. Looking forward to that. We're going to shoot some video of the manufacturers and the shops and Sebring. And so I'll put some videos together for you guys to uh, to look at uh, probably late February, early March by the time I get to the editing on that. But uh, look for uh, those to pop up uh, in a month or so. All right, I want to thank uh, all of our panelists who worked so hard today uh, to uh, put this program together, um, starting with uh, Brian and, uh, and, and Bent Ryder, who always uh, help us out with promotional stuff. Uh, really appreciate that. And uh, all of the panelists um, who have done the slideshow and the directing and answering you guys on the chat. Uh, these guys are amazing, and I appreciate them all so much. So thanks, guys. Um, now, if you want to support the Laidback Black Report, we hope you will, uh, you can do so in a couple of ways. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel again by hitting that little red subscribe button. You can visit our website by hitting that little I up in the upper right-hand corner. It'll take you right to the laidbackblackreport.com. And while you're there, uh, you're going to see something that looks like, uh, well, back one up, if you would. Uh, there you go. Hit that, if you would, Trey. There we go. I just redid the website, so it looks a little bit different than it had before. But you'll see all of the different sections that we have, past shows, bonus material, contact information, uh, all kinds of stuff uh, there for you to catch up on. So please do that. You'll see our sponsors at the top of the page. Please support them if you would. It's, again, something uh, that we require to keep the show going, so please support them. You'll see our most recent shows, our upcoming shows, our past shows, bonus material. And you can also buy a hat, uh, one just like uh, the guys were wearing today. And Larry is, is wearing here. This is when he was in Germany with us. Uh, 20 bucks and $5 shipping and handling. You can go to the website and order a hat. So we would appreciate if you could do that. So you'll find all this at the laidbackbikereport.com. So uh, I'm back to me, if you would, Trey. I wanted to thank uh, all you guys uh, for watching and joining us today. I know it was a long show. We really appreciate you uh, joining in the chat and being part of the show. So from all of us at the Laidback Bike Report, so long, Bent Riders.